Alrighty, welcome back to 353. So we have made it over the hump. All the hard topics are gone. Yay. So you might have noticed it got a bit easier. So let's continue our journey on somewhat easier topics and talk more about file systems. So we've used file systems before. I mean, your virtual machine has file systems. There's folders or directories and files. So the typical layout of like any POSIX type system, so like Linux, the BSDs, things like that, they're actually defined in something very creatively called the FHS or the file system hierarchy standard that just defines what directories should exist. Very exciting name. So that like defines that, hey, you should have a root directory just called slash at the very top. Inside of it should be a bunch of other directories. So there should be a directory called bin that has all of your binary executable files, a directory called dev that has the fake files the kernel's managing that you can interact directly with hardware or maybe make up some terminals, things like that. So they would all be in this folder. There's like etc, which is supposed to store all of your configuration files. There is the home folder, which is supposed to have another folder in it for every single user on your, the machine, and it should be private. And then there's something like the mount directory, or well, they shortened it to MNT, and that is a place where if you plug in a USB drive or something like that, that's typically where you should be able to access that drive. So if I plug in a drive, maybe on my machine, it'll get mounted, or I'll be able to access it through a directory called USB. And then in here, maybe you know, from the root directory, I can get to my home directory. Maybe inside that, there's a directory for me called John. And then maybe in my John directory, I have a file called todo.txt. So your file system will form a directic acyclic graph because everyone loves DAGs. And in here, whenever you're using your terminal or in terms of processes, there's always something called the working directory. So that is typically the current directory your process is actually in. And then any path I give it or any file I will give it will be relative to that directory. So if my current working directory is home slash John, so I'm currently in the John directory, well, then the relative path to todo.txt is just to do.txt, right? I don't have to go into any other folder. I'm in the correct folder. And the difference between that would be the relative path. And on the flip side of a relative path is an absolute path. So the absolute path is just the full path name starting at root. So the full path name for to do.txt would be slash home slash John slash to do.txt. Yay. And then if I wanted to get to this USB directory, well, the relative path from the John directory, I could do like dot dot. So dot dot sends you up a directory, right? So if I did dot dot, that would bring me to home. And then if I do dot dot again, that'll bring me to root. And then I could do slash mount. Then I could do slash USB. So that would be the relative path to the USB directory from home John and the absolute path for, to the USB directory would just be slash mount slash USB. Boom. All right, questions about that? We've been using this pretty much the whole time. This should be more or less review. So here's the answers for that. There are some special symbols, and we will get into how these are actually implemented. They're slightly special, but not terribly special. So. There are some special symbols where a single dot means the current directory. So instead of just to do.txt, I could do dot slash to do.txt. So that says, well, dot is just your current directory. And then dot dot is the parent directory. And then this little tilde thing, that's usually a shortcut to the user's home directory. So in my case, if my user is John, it's probably home slash John. So all the relative paths are all calculated from the current working directory. So also, funny story. Has anyone noticed on Linux, like 
all the hidden files are just any file that starts with a dot. Anyone know why that is? Because guess what? It was a complete accident that it worked that way. Okay, so turns out in a directory there is like a dot and a dot dot. Usually when you ls something, you probably don't want to see dot and dot dot every time, right? You just you don't really care about them. You assume they always exist. So if you were imp implementing ls, well, you could just have like an if statement. So if the current file is a dot, skip it. Or if the file is a dot dot, skip it. Right, two if statements to skip it seems reasonable. What would you do if you were a very clev clever programmer to get that down to one line? Yeah. Yeah, just check if the first character is a dot and then skip it. So someone implemented that. And then guess what? If any file starts with a dot, you can't see it. And then that feature, or sorry, that bug just became a feature. Easy. <laughs> So that is why hidden files on Linux are just any file that starts with a dot. Because some programmer wanted to save a single if statement and he, they totally meant to do that, so they meant to implement hidden files. So fun historical fact with that. So when we access files, we can access them sequentially or randomly. So sequential access just means that each read would just advance like some position inside of a file. So if I read five bytes, well, if I call another system call read on it for another five bytes, I just get the next five bytes until I'm eventually at the end of the file, right? That's how we know how to read files. If we just do a read system call, we just get the bytes in order from the file. And then similarly, if we just did write system calls or how we're doing them right now, the writes are just kind of appended together and the position is set to the end. So if I create a new file and I do a write system call and do like write hello, then hello would be written to the file. And then if I write again and say there, well that just gets appended to the end of that. So then the total contents of my file just say hello there or something like that. And then I can optionally just open a file for writing and just stick my writes onto the very end at the beginning. So we don't know how to do anything other than that. So the other option is to have random access. So that means you can read and write anywhere in the file in any order you want, and you get to specify which byte of the file you want to read at any given time. So how you use that, well, there's the, our old faithful, the open system call that gives you back a file descriptor, takes a path name, some flags like do I want this file able to read to it, write to it, things like that, and then some modes for permissions. And then there's this new system call called lseek, which takes a file descriptor and then an offset. So that tells you which byte you want to be able to read or write to next. And then the third parameter is this whence, which tells you what this offset is relative to. So some options for whence is seek set. So that says just go directly to the byte in the file that I have told you. So if I give whence seek set and set my offset equal to four, that means it's going to move the internal kernel position of that file to the fourth uh, byte. So if I read or write to it, I will either read the fourth byte or modify starting at the fourth byte. Then. The next one is current, so that's relative to wherever I currently am in the file. So if I read all of the file, well, maybe I want to go backwards a little bit and read some more information again. So I could set once to seek current and set my offset to like minus four. So I want to go backwards by four bytes and read the last four bytes again. Or if you're in the middle of a file and you want to back up or go forward, you can do that. And then the third option is seek end, so that's relative to the end. So if I want to go directly to the end of the file, I could just set whence to seek end and offset to zero, and then boom, it will just point me to the end of the file. If I read something, it's not gonna be there. If I write to it, well, I would start writing from the end of the file. So new system call we get to get, 
And this will uh, make our lives kind of fun once it interacts with Quark and all these things because there are subtle things that go on here. So other things just so we have functions like gall get out of the way. So you've done this before to access a directory. So this is the API. You open a directory, you can read directory. You've kind of done this already in lab two. Print the directory contents, all of that stuff. Just so you have it here. We won't really use it in the examples, but hey, this is probably where it should be in the lecture notes, so there we go. So now we get to talk about what file descriptors actually represent. So each process essentially has a file table in it, and that would be stored in that process control block. And that file table is basically a giant array, and the file descriptor is an index into that array, which is why I called it a pointer and said think of it as a pointer at the beginning. So I said just think of it as a pointer to a file. Turns out that was not a lie, but also not the whole truth. So what it's pointing to, it's going to point to a few things. So it's going to point to all the information about the file and like the current permissions you are you have with that file. So one of the entries it will point to is like, what is the current position of this file descriptor in that file? So I could open two file descriptors to the same file, but I could, they could be in different places in the file. So the position would be part of the file table entry and then flags whether or not I can read and write this uh, file descriptor or not. And then there is this V node pointer. So it's, short for virtual node, and it basically represents anything you can read and write bytes to. So could represent our terminal, could represent a socket, could represent, well, it could also represent a directory, but here let's just assume it represents a normal file. So there would just be like a V node for some file A. So that would actually be the contents of the file and We'll explore in the next lecture exactly, how, well, towards the end of this lecture, we'll explain how we store a file. So in process one, it could also have file descriptor one, which points to a different position, flags in Vino that points to some file B. And then maybe in another process, process two, it's file descriptor zero points to an entry that has its own independent position, own independent flags, and its vnode points to the same file B. So they can both read that file starting at the beginning to the end because, well, they are both independent here. So each process will have this file table as part of its piece process control block. File descriptor, basically just an index into this table. What actually happens is each item, it is just a pointer, but it points to a system-wide global open file table. So this thing in the middle here, oops. So this thing in the middle here would be like our global, global open file table. So that would be managed by the kernel. So the kernel knows how many processes are accessing what file. And well, if it was a pipe, it would know how many processes have access to the pipe. More specifically, what it cares about is how many processes have access to the right end of the pipe. So that is the proper name for that. They call it a GOF table, global, global open file table. Why they want to call it a GOF, I don't know. It sounds terrible to me. But basically it tells you the current seek position, some flags, and then points to a V node, so which is just anything that supports standard reading and writing bytes to it. So would hold, yeah, the V node would hold information about the file. They can represent regular files, pipes, network sockets, directories, all sorts of different things. And towards the end of this lecture, like I said, we'll get into how to actually store the contents of a regular file. But now we have to remember what happens during a fork. So the process control block, com oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in the process control block for each function, they would have a local open file table that just points to an entry in the global open file table. So for example, the position of flags in the you know, of specific file descriptor is not stored in the process. So if you were to have two files that 
two things pointing at the same one and a modifier where it's pointing with an offset that would modify both the processes? Yeah. Yeah, so this is where it gets complicated with forks. So in this, they're kind of independent, but if I were to fork process two in this case, well, it would copy the file table and the new processes file descriptor zero would point to the same thing. So if one process read, it would move that position. And then if the other process read, well, it wouldn't read what the other one just read, right? It would already be moved because it is a global entry. So that is where we will get into fun and where uh, any confusion of this stuff may occur. So yeah, so again, what happens with the fork? Process control block gets copied. Specifically for us, that like local open file table that's part of the process that just points to a global entry gets copied. So both process control blocks point to the same global entry and that would look, I mean, something like this. You have process one, process two. If they're copies, well, both of their file descriptor zeros point to the same global open file table entry, which has a position, has flags, and has a vnode pointing to some files. So there are going to be some gotchas with this. So that means, oh, yep. So copy, so the question is, uh, how does this relate to copy on write or how does copy on write come in here? So when we fork, we just create a whole new, like we just create a copy of the global open file table. Copy on write is only for virtual memory. And just copying is just how we deal with the virtual memory part of that. So remember both processes have to be independent. So to make them independent, they get their own, uh, they get their own file table. And then we also have to do something with their virtual memory. We would have to essentially create a new version of a thread for each of them too. And they'd need to look like exact copies that are independent after the fork. So yeah. So yeah, some fun gotchas. So that current position is shared between both processes. So if you did like an L seek in one process, well that affects every other process that forked because you're pointing to the same global open file table entry and Otherwise, if you open the same file in both processes after you fork, that would create two independent global open file tables. So whenever you do an open system call, that creates a new entry in the global open file table, and you can essentially only share them through forking. So if I had something like this, so in my program, I did an open of todo.txt, and then I forked, and then I did open b.txt, how many entries would I have in the global open file table and how many entries would each process have in its own uh, file table, assuming that both neither process have any file descriptors open. So before this line executes in our first process, we got nothing open, so no file descriptors. So hopefully what should happen is, let's say process one runs, it does an open. So that would create a new global open file table entry that the kernel gets to manage. And then I fork. So now I have two processes that are exact clones of each other. They are both have one entry and they're both pointing to the same global open file table. And then afterwards, well, after the fork, I have two processes. I don't know what one is going to execute next. In this case, I don't really care. They're both going to do the same thing. So they both independently after the fork open b.txt. So that would create two local file or yeah, that would create a local open file table in that process and also a new global entry in the global open file table. So each of them would have their each of them would have an independent 
copy of b.txt so you could go ahead and read the whole thing. So that kind of clear? Yeah? Does it mean that the kernel has to keep track of how many local file descriptors are pointing at global ones to make sure that so, so the point like any dead one? Right? So the local one has to point to a global one. So the first process is going to open to do.txt. That's going to create a global entry. And then you fork. So the new process is also going to point to that entry. So. And then once you run b.txt in, in one of the processes, that's, is that going to create a new? Yeah. OK, and then what happens to the older one when it also tries to open b.txt? So both of them would create a new global open entry. So what, what it would look like. So to do.txt would be a different file descriptor than b.txt. Okay. So what it would look like, probably something like this. So each process has, its, has two entries in it. So the parent process, well, it would have file descriptor 0. That would point to a global open file table entry. That would have a position flags v node. That v node would point to to do.txt. And then after the fork, the child is going to look exactly the same. So it would have file descriptor 0, which points to the exact same entry. And then afterwards, they both independently open b.txt. So let's say the parent ran first. It would get a new entry in the global open file table. So it would have its own position flags and vnode that points to b.txt. And then in the child, whenever it executes, that would be a new entry in the global open file table with its own independent position flags vnode, and that vnode points to b.txt. Yep? What if we then go to a child, for example, and we modify, you know, we do to the zero file descriptor to be also b.txt? If we dupe the file descriptor, then we would just change file descriptor zero to point to this one, right? Okay. So, so the, pa the parent can't point to this one. There's no way to access it. Oh, so like, as long as one process is pointing to the global open file table, then it's fine, right? If no processes are currently pointing to it, the kernel can go ahead, free it up, use that entry for something else. So let us see here. So. Here is a fun little program just to illustrate exactly what happens here. Let's see if we know what will happen here. So I have two files, A and B. They are very exciting files. So the content of file A just says, this is file A. The content of file B says, well, this one is file B. And then in my program, in my main, I open, I do an open of a.txt, open it as read only. Then I fork, and then I open b.txt, and then I have this fu function called read file that just creates a buffer, does a read system call, and then make sure it's just null terminated because I'm going to print it as a string. And then it will print off the process ID of the current process, how many bytes it read, and then the string it actually read. So if I run this program, what will I see? And I don't care about byte counts. So, yep. So, so I see the contents of the file essentially two times each. What? So one time each? So, so I'll have two processes each printing two files, right? 
So one process is just going to print the contents of the whole file, and then the other process is going to print zero. Yeah, so this should print file A, this should print file B, and, but I have two processes, right? Because so, I'm doing a fork? So will both processes print out all of file A? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so this is where it actually matters. So here, I do an open before the fork. So that creates a new global entry that has its own position, flags, all of that stuff. And then when I fork, well, the new process, the new child process also gets, looks exactly like the parent. So it's pointing to the exact same global entry. So both processors are pointing to the same global entry for this a.txt. And then after the fork, I don't know which one's going to execute, but they both open b.txt, which just creates a new global entry for each process, just like we had here. So they would each get their own position flags and everything. So what should happen is, since file descriptor one is shared between the process, assuming that my read system call just reads the whole file, I don't know which one's going to run first, but whatever one reads, runs first is going to read the contents of the whole file. The position's going to be set to the end, so it's done, so it just prints the contents of the file, and then if the other one tries to read it, well, the first process already read it, the position's at the end of the file, so it will get zero bytes, it won't read anything. But since FD2, that essentially is my open entries for b.txt. Since they're independent, I should see the full file in both of them because if I read the file in one, while well, it's a different global entry, it might update the position there, but since they're not shared, doesn't matter. So if I run that, that's what I get. So this process happened to run first. It read 15 bytes, so it read this is file A. And then the other child process, probably because its process ID number is higher, it read zero bytes. While for b.txt, both files read the entire contents of the file because they had their own global entries. Yep. Yeah, in terms of the PIDs, the parent ran first, read, and then we context switch over the child, and then the child executed pretty much all the way, and then we switch back to the parent, and then parent ran. Is that because read is a slower operation? Uh, is that because read is a slower operation? I assume there's a different order. So it doesn't matter, just got unlucky. So this one, the child, the child went first, so not even predictable. The child went first, read all of file A, then the parent got nothing, and then we switched back to the child, it read all of file B, and then it switched back to the parent, we got all of file B. So, fun, right? If, if you didn't know the global entries and this happened to you where you forked and then you tried to read a whole file, um, and you just got nothing in one process, you'd probably be very confused. So this is why you have to be careful about it. So imagine like I couldn't read all of a.txt in one system call. What might happen if this essentially was just, you know, just a while read does not equal zero, just keep on reading over and over again. 
And I just opened the file descriptor fork, and then both of them had that like while read, just read the data. Do I know which process is going to read what? <laughs> no, all I know is that one process, like they're going to be mutually exclusive. So one process might read the first half of the file, the other process might get the second. They might get some random assortment of characters, they might interleave. You have no idea. So this is the cautionary tale to be careful if you are forking with file descriptors. Sometimes you want that behavior where it's shared. So like for the terminal, so like copying standard in, standard out, all of that is fine. They're all sharing the position. So no matter what process is running, well, it writes to your terminal and then essentially just gets appended to the end and you don't see anything weird and you can't even seek with the terminal to begin with. So any questions about that fun thing? So that is your cautionary tale for the evening. So now we have to talk about how we would actually store a file on a disk. So if we were actually to store a file on a disk, well, how would we store it? We might think of storing it like memory, so like everything is contiguous. So here we kind of have to just explain how we would describe how to get to the contents of a file. So if I just think of it the same way as, I don't know, a pointer or malloc or something like that, how would you describe an array to me if I was a complete dummy? And you want to uniquely tell me everything about an array with just two pieces of information. Yeah. Yeah, where it starts and how, si and how big it is essentially, right? So that could be how we represent a file. So assume this is our disk and our disk is divided up into blocks. Well, we could just describe file green. So file green could say it starts at block zero and then it's three blocks big. This red file starts at block one, two, three, four, five, or zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Starts at block six, and it's six blocks big. That could be how our file system works. Everyone thinks it looks like an array. <laughs> so if that's how I represented files, what would I have to do in this case if, I don't know, say the red file was, I don't know, my stream recording, and it got bigger. What do I have to do to make this file one block bigger if it has to be contiguous? Yeah. Yeah, I have to boot, yeah, I have to boot the blue file the hell out of the way, and then I can go ahead and move space. Like, that's what malloc might do if it runs out of room, or just move the red file here so it has more room. But for memory, that's not that big, that might be okay. For file systems that are, maybe that red file is like, I don't know, 10 gigabytes, then probably a bad idea to do that. So we could do that, turns out to be a very bad idea with files. So if we had contiguous allocation, it would be really fast if there's no modifications and space efficient. So to describe a file, all I need to tell you is what block it starts at and how many blocks it needs. And then for random access, I can figure out exactly what block I need to get to by just making a single calculation. So you just take the offset and the block size, so that basically means, let's say our blocks were four kilobytes. Well, if I want to access byte 4,000, well, that's on block zero. I can just calculate that immediately. If I want to go to byte 4,098, well, that would be on block one. I know exactly how to get to it. All I have to do is do a simple calculation. Bad things are that files can't really grow that easily. So now we get to talk about this fun word fragmentation, which basically means wasted space. So internal fragmentation just means like within a block, I waste some space. So for file systems, typically we just deal with blocks. So if they're a four kilobyte block, and your file is only 10 bytes large, while well, you're wasting 4,086 bytes. But we call that internal fragmentation because it's within a block and we don't really care about it. And then 
external fragmentation is going to be wasted space between the blocks or essentially wasted blocks. So we might have external fragmentation when blocks are like deleted or truncated. So like, let's say I made the red file one smaller. Okay, well there's this like hole of one, of one block just kind of in the middle of the red and the blue file. And if all my files are two blocks, well, I can never use that space ever again. So it's essentially wasted. So everyone in this course loves linked lists. So we could store a file using a linked list, right? So that is called linked allocation. So I could tell you, well, I guess I don't have to tell you, but to keep track of linked allocation, you just have to tell me essentially like what the head of the list is, so what the first element is, and then to get to anything, I could just follow pointers to the next element, and then it doesn't really matter what blocks, they don't have to be all in a row. So if I want to make this file bigger, well, I grab any old block, doesn't really matter, and I just make my next pointer point to it, and that's great, easy to grow, but, what is bad about this? Yeah. Yeah, if I want to read the whole file, well, I don't know exactly, let's say I want to like go to the end of the file and I don't want anything else. Well, to go to the end of the file, I have to access every single block and hop all around and make it to the very end, which is bad. <laughs> So really, really slow. So pros, space efficient. So to describe a file, you just need to tell me what block starts the file and then I can go ahead and follow pointers. But yeah, end files can grow and shrink. There's no external fragmentation. I can use one block as good as any other block. No risk of wasting a block. Like with file systems, we just accept internal fragmentation. So not using the full contents of a block, but now we have really bad uh, random access speed. So we need to walk each block and each block might be far away on disk. So like loading a block might take a lot of time. So can anyone think of an idea to still use linked list because we love linked list, but make this go faster. So like in this case, in order to walk all of them, I have to read this block which points to this block, read this block, then read this block. Okay, what does it point to? This block, I have to read it. Then do this block, read it. Oh, this block, read it. How could I speed that up that, yeah, how could I speed up my description of a file? Yep. Yeah, perfect. I just have a block that all it does is store all of the pointers and then I can use my beloved linked list and I just access a whole block. It's all full of pointers. So if I need to go to the end, I at least don't have to read another block. I just keep following them and I don't really have to do anything special. So they're all there. So that is what a file allocation table is. And if you have used Windows, well, that is what FAT32 stands for. So file allocation table, there it is. So. All it does is move that list to a separate table and the table represents like all of the blocks on the disk. So the size of this table is going to be proportional to how many blocks are on the disk. And then that is what your file allocation table is and it is just a list of pointers. Basically it's a linked list, same idea, but they're just all located together. So this could be the contents of my disk, all the usable blocks I can use for files, named zero all the way to 24. So maybe to describe my file, st still same idea, I can say the file starts at block zero, but instead of having to read this block, then going to block six, then reading this block and going to block two, well, let's assume that this big file allocation table is in memory. I can be like, oh, it starts at two, boom. I go to six, that's the next block. 
Okay, after that I go to two. Okay, after two I go to 13. After 13 I go to nine. After nine I go to 18. And then that's the end of my file. So if any of you have a Windows machine, even though you know, your C partition might be a different file system, the file system that you boot off is this. So this is really, really simple. Um, and it's essentially linked allocation, but smarter and more performant. So questions about that. So same benefits as linked allocation files can grow and shrink at will. Don't have any external fragmentation, still have internal fragmentation, but that's pretty much every single file system. And then we have fast random access because that file allocation table could just be held in memory. You could cache it, you could just read it. But the size of this table is going to increase linearly to disk size. It can be very large, so that's why your they use it for your boot partition because typically that's fairly small. But if you use it on like a 12 terabyte drive, probably a bad idea because, well, you need as many pointers as there are blocks on the disk. So how could I make random access speed go faster? Hint, don't use linked lists. So if I don't use a linked list, how could I describe a file smarter? Yeah. Same thing with page two. Yeah, pointers going directly, but so there's linked lists and then there are fast, starts with an A. Arrays, thank you. And we should use arrays. We've never used a linked list before, right? All right. So an idea could be well, I could just use an array to describe a file instead. So maybe I do that. So each file, I just use a block and it is an array of pointers to blocks. So then I don't have to traverse anything. So this, let's say I use this block as just storing an array of pointers. So this red block would describe my file. And then for that same green file, well, maybe the pointer at block or the pointer at index zero would be what block zero uh, I need to read in the file. So maybe that points to this block on disk. Then block one of the file is associated with block six on the disk. Block two of the file is associated with block two, so on and so forth. Da 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 da. So would this be a lot faster? Probably, right? So, what, um, yeah, what is the main drawback with this one, though? Yeah. Lots of memory? Kind of, yeah. Sorry, a lot of. Yeah, you need an index block for all the files you have, but it wastes about the same amount of space as the file, uh, the file allocation table. Yeah. How do you know how long each array has to be? So like, how do you know how many blocks are in each file? Oh, how do we know how many blocks are in each file? Well, you could just fill this up with pointers and hope it, and then that would be the limit of the size of your file. Right, is that what you're gonna say too? Yeah. Okay, well, if we just have one block full of pointers to describe a file, well, how big could our file be? Wait, first let's summarize this though. So for index allocation, well, file still has all the same benefits. So files can grow and shrink at will. We have fast random access because it's an array. And the, benef or the main drawback is that the file size is going to be limited by like the maximum size of the block. So. We have a little problem now. This kind of looks like an easy version of page tables. So let's assume an index block just stores pointers to data blocks. There's no other information. And then a disk block, let's say it's eight kilobytes in size, just to be fun. 
And then a pointer to a block is four bytes. So what we should be able to answer is what is the maximum size of a file represented by this block, or represented by this index block? Four bytes. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, going ahead, 16 megabytes. Why is it 16 megabytes? Well, so the block size is going to be two to the 13. Pointer is two to the two. So the number of pointers I could fit on a block is essentially two to the 13 divided by two to the two, which is two to the 11. So that is, whoops. So that is the number of pointers per block, and then, well, that's how many pointers I can point, or how many blocks I can point to. So I can point to two to the 11 blocks, and then each block is two to the 13. So that means the maximum size of my file could be two to the 24, which sounds kind of big, right? Except that, well, that's the same as two to the four times two to the 20, and then this is a megabyte, and two to the four is 16. So that means the maximum size of the file would be 16 megabytes. Is that good? No, you'd probably be pretty pissed, right? If you went to store, I don't know, any file or anything, and it's like, yeah, your maximum size is 16 megabytes, too bad, so sad, probably be pissed, yeah. Ah, so, yeah, if I want to support a larger file, well, well, maybe I just grab another index bit, right? Oh, okay, well, now it can be 32 megabytes. Sounds lame. So what we'll get into in the next lecture is like, same idea with page tables. I could just have a block of pointers that point to another block of pointers, and then suddenly, well, that would be like two to the 11, two to the 11 if I just do like two levels. And then suddenly, well, that's, that's a lot bigger of a file. That's what would be like 32 gigabytes, which would be slightly better. But yeah, that's gonna be the idea for the next lecture. So that's why we do page tables first because that idea constantly gets reused. So file systems, that is what enables persistence. So we need to describe how files are stored on disk. We will go over how most systems actually store file systems on disk, but spoiler alert, it's pretty much like the idea of multi-level page tables, but there's some trade-offs because, well, we don't want everything to be slow. So unlike with virtual memory, we don't have a TLB or anything to help us out. So we'll have some tricks up our sleeves for performance reasons. But API-wise, right, we can open files, change the position to read and write at. We know that each process has like a local open file table that points to a global file table entry. Could cause some surprises with forks if you don't, uh, if you don't realize that. And then we saw some allocation strategies. Contiguous, not used. Link, not used. File allocation table over FAT. Well, that's used sometimes. And then index isn't used, but that will lead us into our next idea again in the next lecture. So just remember, bowling for you, we're all in this together.